So welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Frederick Linsness and I am with NetHope and I want to welcome everyone to yet another NetHope Solution Center webinar. Uh, to do, today we're doing the third in the series of webinars for the No Loss Generation Tech Task Force. And uh, the topic today is expanding economic opportunities here in refugees uh, and youth in, in Turkey. Uh, before we get underway, I just want to go over our regular housekeeping rules. Uh, please uh, stay muted um, while you're not talking, and uh, we will allow you to come off mute towards the very end if uh, it need be during our question and answer session. Uh, we do want this to be interactive, so please line up your questions uh, in the chat window as we go along, and uh, we will facilitate uh, discussions towards the end uh, of the hour today. Um, we'll also uh, ask you to fill out a webinar satisfaction poll towards the end of the session today, so please uh, consider uh, answering that. There'll, there's also another poll that we'll point to uh, later on uh, that uh, we'd like you to answer relative to the overall uh, no loss generation uh, uh, tech task force. And uh, as uh, usual, we are recording the session, so I look for a follow-up email with pointers to where you can find the recording and the collateral today so you can review it and share with colleagues that uh, may not have been able to, uh, to attend the session themselves. So I'm uh, pleased to introduce uh, Leila Toplik. She is with NetHope and she's leading the No Lost Generation Tech Task Force efforts uh, for us here. She's gonna be introducing the topic today. And we also we have uh, Erica Tavares uh, from International Medical Corps, a, uh, a NetHope member, and we're excited to hear what uh, uh, she has to, sh uh, to share. And uh, Debbie Ledbetter from HPE Life, um, and HP, uh, another great supporter of, of NetHope. So we're very, very pleased to have you, all three of you. I'll pass it on to you, Leila. Great. Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon. Um, just going to click to my slides quickly. Uh, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, um, welcome to the NLG Tech Task Force. Um, the task force, um, Frederick, if you could just, um, oh, here we go, I'm the presenter, so I'll click to the first slide just so you have this backdrop again for those of you who are new to the task force. Um, the task force was set up by NetHope and the No Loss Generation Initiative to facilitate collaboration both within the international development community and also between the NGO and private sector with the focus on ICT-enabled programs for refugee education. Um, membership um, has grown since we launched the, um, in, uh, the task force back in March. We now have over 30 um, organizations representing both global and local NGOs, uh, private sector companies, academic institutions, and host government. Um, in terms of uh, the work that we've done to date, just clicking to the next slide, following the launch of the task force at the EdTech Summit in Amman, Jordan in March, uh, we've been hosting a series of webinars. And these webinars are really designed to highlight programs and ICT-enabled solutions um, that support education and livelihoods of refugee and IDP children and youth, really with the goal to help provide new resources uh, to all of you, to the task force members, and also to initiate new collaborations uh, both uh, with the NGO community and also with the private sector companies like HP, for example. Uh, programs and tools that are featured on the task force webinars are examples, and then also selection of webinar themes is based on your needs and ask, asks. You can always provide feedback via the task force poll. Link will be provided in the chat window and also um, in the recap email. So this first phase of webinars is underway and the focus is on the needs and asks that were shared at the NLG EdTech Summit in March, where participants asked to learn more about first NetHub's Project Reconnect um, and also ICT-enabled solutions for education, skills training, and also employment of refugee and IDP youth and adolescents. So on this slide, you see an overview of the webinars we've had to date. Um, recordings and recaps are available on the NLG Tech Task Force. 
Um, and also what's coming, today's webinar and later in May, we'll have a webinar with Coursera and Chiron focusing on higher education opportunities. So now I'm thrilled to welcome Erica Tavares from the International Medical Corps and Debbie Ludbetter from HP Foundation. Erica and Debbie will provide um, an overview of a collaboration between IMC and HP on Maharat Center in Turkey that offers skills training to refugee youth and adults complemented with mentorships, internships, and apprenticeships. They will also talk about the role that technology has played in supporting skills training and also addressing some of the challenges that the center has encountered recently. So I'm really pleased to um, introduce Erica and Debbie and look forward to hearing from them and your questions during the presentation. Erica. Wonderful, thank you. Uh so much, Layla, and, and thank you, Debbie, and, and thank you for, for having us both here today. It's a, a project that we're um, excited to, to talk about. I'm just going to sort of access my slides here. So, um, you know, just sort of starting more broadly and, and won't spend too much time on the background because I know we're all very well versed, um, but, you know, the, the Syria crisis is still obviously the biggest humanitarian emergency in the world today. and um, you know, 470,000 people um, have died from the conflict, and there's now, we've topped 5 million Syrian refugees who've fled to, to neighboring countries. And as a result, there are Syrian youth who've been out of school for seven or more years. Uh, there's young adults who've not had the prospect of ever having a skilled, um, skilled education or, or uh, college education. And in some cases, elementary school children have never known life um, other than as a refugee or living inside a refugee camp. So I think, um, you know, this partnership and really looking at that, at how to, to help this um, or, or prevent a lost generation is, is incredibly important. International Medical Corps briefly has been on the front lines of this crisis, no matter where that has been. We, we do have programs inside Syria, as well as in each of the primary refugee countries, Jordan, Turkey, Lebanon, and Iraq. Um, and in 2015, when the front lines of the crisis moved to Europe, we did two, and we launched mobile medical teams, water sanitation, hygiene services, and, and other services to people in Europe um, and to refugees who had arrived there. Um, today we'll be talking, you know, most specifically about Turkey, which of course is home to more refugees than any other country in the world, with 2.7 million Syrian refugees um, and, and growing in many cases. Um, so certainly um, they have um, quite a challenge in, in figuring out how to integrate, best integrate, and best respond to refugee needs inside their country. Um, with the stay of a refugee in a host community lasting on average, you know, two decades, um, the country is faced with enormous challenges, especially as they look to how do they best integrate refugees and provide them with employment and education opportunities. International Medical Corps has been registered in Turkey since 2012, um, working with both refugees and vulnerable members of the community there. And while we provide a, a range of services across the country, uh, one of the things I wanted to, to talk a little bit more about today was um, our one, what we call a one-stop shop, but a, the multi-service uh, centers that we're running in Turkey. And we run these um, in urban areas and in areas where there are high concentrations of, in particular, Syrian refugees. Um, and these multi-service centers were really designed initially to provide um, access to services and referrals for the most urgent kinds of, of care for refugees who are arriving in country. So how they could find primary health care um, and other health care services, where they might be able to access housing, how they could find financial support and, and access to legal services. And some of those things were provided directly um, through the centers themselves. And then we've also maintained a broad referral system so that we can point refugees in the right direction to find out other opportunities um, and services that are available to them. Um, over time, and, and as I think the conflict has continued in Syria and we've seen the number of refugees grow, we started receiving an increased number of questions about training, employment opportunities, language skills training, um, and other um, sort of employment and educational opportunities. And so that really led to the development of, of the Maharat Center. Um, which was um, the first center that we opened um, focused on livelihoods inside Turkey. And so Maharat means skill, 
our skills rather in, in Arabic. And so we um, designed the center to really um, offer classes um, that, you know, would address um, immediate employment opportunities and uh, skills training for Syrian refugees. So it was launched in May 2016, and, and it's really been from the very start a collaboration with the private sector. Um, UNHCR has been a significant supporter of the center, but um, Hilton Worldwide, uh, for example, really um, came to support the center and also helped us find the building, helped us renovate the building, and make the space available for training. Um, we've also worked with um, SAP and, of course, HP, which we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about today. So it really has been a, a public-private sector initiative from, from the very start. Uh, the center itself was targeted to reach youth, uh, men and women ages 18 to 25, and in just over, or just about a year of operation, we've had um, more than 800 refugees access the center for a variety of classes, um, many of them accessing it for technology classes, but we do, uh, or we do offer other types of classes there as well. Um, so you can see here some of the photos of, of our classes, some of them um, part of our partnership with HP, some of them are other classes that are taking place. And here we have um, just, you know, when we think about overall program design and what the goals of the center are and to provide a variety of training opportunities, this gives you a good sense of the, the size and the scope of it. So you can see certainly um, computer and incubation centers and labs to allow for people to, to attend online courses. Um, and to incubate um, potential startups or, or entrepreneurship opportunities, a vocational training room that, that really looks at vocational training beyond technology-based training. We did, we've done trainings and things like the hospitality industry. Um, program office space, and, and I want to highlight specifically, and we'll come back to this, but we do have um, mental health and our psychosocial support staff located within the center itself um, because there is a component of the center that does address some of those needs. And then meeting rooms, both for our staff, um, but also for um, refugees to use themselves. Um, so to meet with each other or to meet with a potential employer or if they have a potential funder for an entrepreneurship opportunity. There we go. Um, this just kind of shows another um, view of the layout. So you can see lots of, of computer space available. Um, you know, and lots of, of joint workspace available to encourage uh, collaboration and to allow for uh, potential students and entrepreneurs to meet with mentors um, and other staff as needed. Um, and then one of the things um, that you know, we've really worked hard at the Madharat Center um, to integrate is really the use of technology. And, and to Layla's point earlier, um, you know, when we're thinking about how technology supports our work, um, of course, there's the skills training side of it, but we, we also used Facebook um, to drive attendance and to make sure that, that refugees understood and knew that these offices and services were available. So um, we do know, I'm sure many of you know, that there um, is a relatively high percentage of Syrian refugees who have access to cell phone, specifically smartphone um, usage. And so we, this Facebook page allows people to find out what kinds of services are being offered at the center. It allows them to ask questions um, and for services and referrals. And it specifically allows for students to enroll in upcoming sessions, which has really helped us to plan better, to understand sort of demand better and, and provide services that, that are needed. And so that's um, you know, really at a sort of high level, um, the kind of program design and, and design of the center itself. And before um, we talk a little bit more about how we worked with HP to integrate the HP Life program, I'll uh, turn it over to Debbie to talk a little bit about what HP Life is. Great, thank you. And Erica, can you, there we go. <laughs> Uh, Frederick, there. Perfect. Okay. Hi, I'm Debbie Ledbetter, and I'm just going to give you a really quick overview of what HP Life is. Um, so HP Life um, is free online business and IT training, and is used globally. HP um, was created to help people improve their business skills and digital literacy to start or grow a business or to gain skills for a current or new job to better their lives.
We have 27 courses in seven languages. HP Life is free and available for everyone to use. Uh, we do work with partners to integrate HP Life into programs. And we also have uh, users that just use Find Us and use our courses. We do have over 650,000 users since HP Life went live in mid-2012. And as I mentioned, we are in seven languages, and the languages are English, French, uh, Simplified Chinese, Arabic, Hindi, Portuguese, and Spanish. So this is a screenshot of our front page. Um, you can find us at life-global.org. And in addition to the courses, um, we have many other resources available. One of the things that we do um, are live webinars where we invite business experts in to speak. The last three webinars that we had were design thinking, crowdfunding, and how to grow and scale your business. The webinars are recorded so that people can come in and listen to them at any time they want. We also curate business articles and tools um, on various different business topics. And we also provide educator resources to help instructors use HP Life. We do have an instructor manual that provides a summary of the courses, discussion questions, and activities for every single course we have. And we also have success stories on the site um, where you know, people, we highlight people who have created businesses and to have bettered their lives and to, to inspire others. This is a list of our courses. Uh, our courses cover startup, innovate, finance, marketing, operations, and communications. Um, the courses are very short, they're practical, they're interactive, and they give a good basic understanding of the topic. The courses are meant to provide a very good learning in a short amount of time. All the courses are self-paced, so the user can take the courses at any time, and they take about one hour to complete. Um, the courses begin with a real-life business scenario, so the user understands the business issue. Uh, the user goes on to learn about how about the business issue and how to solve uh, solve it, and also how to apply technology. Uh, we provide next step resources to allow the user to learn more about the topic. And we also have downloadable resources for every course, um, which could be a profit and loss spreadsheet or a break-even analysis spreadsheet, could be tips or other useful information that the user can download um, and use later. Um, users can take one course, they can take five courses, they can take all of them, and it doesn't matter what order they take. So it really is about you know, what interests them and what their needs are. We do continue to enhance the platform. Uh, we added design thinking and business communications courses earlier this year, and I am working on uh, more new and updated courses, and I'm also working to implement a business planning functionality. So as the user goes through the courses, they can start jotting down notes about potential or existing uh, business. So as, let's say, a person goes through the target audience course, they can start thinking about who their target audience is and actually jot down those ideas as they go through the course. And at the end of the business plan, then they can actually download the business plan, work on it some more, and use it uh, to start the business or perhaps to get funding. At the end of uh, the courses, you get a certificate of completion. Uh, we also have a transcript, um, so this is useful if a user takes multiple HP Life courses. Um, you get the certificate if you have completed the course successfully, and we do have lots of guides to help the user um, complete the activities successfully. As I mentioned, uh, we do work with partners such as International Medical Corp to implement HP Life into programs. Uh, these can be programs such as entrepreneurship or workforce development programs. It can be schools, uh, universities, community colleges, and high schools. Um, we have many different partner programs. We have in countries such as Myanmar, Tunisia, Nigeria, Morocco, the US, Turkey, India, and many other countries. Um, so I would say if HP Life looks like a useful resource for your organization, please use it. Um, it is accessible to everyone, and as I mentioned, it's at life-global.org. And please spread the word to other organizations that you work with that you think might be able to use HP Life as well. So Erica, back to you. Great. Uh, thank you so much. I'm just going to kind of grab control here. 
Okay. So we were, of course, um, thrilled with the opportunity to uh, partner with HP and to integrate HP Life into the Maharat Center as part of our overall training curriculum. And um, you know, this this partnership, um, like many of international medical corps partnerships with the private sector, uh, was really multifaceted. And um, you know, it included the donation of hardware. So um, HP was very generous in helping us equip the Maharat Center with computers, laptops, printers, and other hardware and, and to support the facility overall, and then specifically to support access to the HP Life program. Um, of course, the, the donation of, of HP Life and, and training um, around that. And um, so that's been an important part, um, of course, of the, the partnership. Um, we've also looked at how we can work together um, to explore additional opportunities to provide employment. So skills training is certainly a very, very important part of the equation, but, you know, the reason for the skills training is to help these Syrian refugees find employment opportunities in Turkey. And so we'll talk a little bit more about how we're also working together to, to try and address that. And then um, ongoing support and service. and. Um, you know, this has been, I think, really one of the, the most important pieces of our partnership with HP and, and a hallmark of how we've worked together. Um, and I, I raise it not just because I want to um, sort of thank HP publicly on the phone, although I certainly want to do that, um, but um, also because I think it's really so important when we're talking about working in contexts like the refugee crisis um, as a result of the Syria conflict, that we have a partner that understands the fluid nature of the context of, of where we're working and some of the challenges that we may see along the way. And we'll talk a little bit more about the challenges later, but um, having HP and having the ability to call Debbie or one of her colleagues and kind of talk about what are the challenges we're seeing or what are one of the anticipated needs that we're having and having a partner that really is committed to working through that with us has been incredibly important um, for the, the ongoing development of, of this program. Um, so just wanted to sort of flag that as well when you're looking at um, how you develop successful um, NGO private sector partnerships. Um, so the program design around HP Life um, has had a couple of components. Um, I'm actually going to start in the middle with um, highlighting that this is the first time that the program has been delivered to with a target audience of, of refugees. And so um, that has been, I think, um, a new dynamic and has um, created some, some learnings around that. Um, the opportunity for blended learning. So HP Life is an online learning a module, you can go on and access it and take the courses. But what we did, um, working very closely with Debbie, was um, provide a training of trainers opportunity. So um, International Medical Corps uses, as our trainers in the Maharat Center, both staff as well as um, Syrian refugees who volunteer to support the, the training program. So we've actually had refugees who've taken some of the courses who then um, attend webinars or who have had access to, to Debbie and her team um, to have a real hands-on um, training opportunity and then go forward and, and act as facilitators during these blended um, learning sessions. So we'll have um, one of the courses be available at a certain time in the classroom. Refugees will come in and take those courses um, and a staff member, master trainer, and these um, you know, other Syrian refugees who are volunteering actually are in the classroom walking around, answering questions, providing advice and guidance, um, and helping facilitate students as they make their way through the course. Um, so that, that's how it's worked um, on a day-to-day on -day level. Um, progress to date, and so what we've, been, what we've been able to find, we've had 363 users over the, you know, since October 2016, so roughly over the last six months. Um, the courses are taken in both Arabic and English. Um, and then we've um, had a 55% completion rate of our courses. So, um, you know, a, a MOOC, an online training course, generally has a 5 to 10% completion rate. I know HP Life actually averages a little bit higher, about 60 to 70%. Um, but, you know, I also know that, that um, HP Life, a lot of um, users or a number of users can receive accreditation or college credit, which isn't certainly something that's available yet through the Maharat Center. So um, we are happy um, to have achieved the 55% completion rate. We weren't quite sure what to expect, um, you know, with the refugees and, and with those who are going to be coming and, access it and accessing it. Um, and so you can see there on the, the right-hand side some of the um, most popular um, both webinars that were attended by our staff and volunteers, as well as the courses that we've um, provided um, to the students. 
Um, and so, you know, I think, um, as I mentioned earlier, I know an important part of the work is not just providing this training, but really partnering to figure out how to, to create some job placement opportunities. Um, so, um, you know, utilizing um, kind of the HP Life program and then the center more broadly, some of the things we've done to um, help um, refugees find employment, um, you know, include things like um, partnerships with private sector companies that facilitate job placement. So we've worked specifically with United Work and RIZIK, R-I-Z-K, in Turkey, um, and we've created a partnership with them where they will let us know what kinds of jobs they are trying to find um, employees for, and we share, you know, make those available to, to the students and refugees who are coming to, to our center and share CVs of people who are interested and have the right skill set for what they're looking for. Um, we've also hosted two career fairs, one in December and one in April, and participants included uh, universities as well as companies from a wide variety of sectors, and included advertising, retail, uh, companies that do tran provide translation services, tourism, hospital and healthcare facilities, um, automotive sales, and then other job placement private sector companies as well. And then I think, you know, one of the, the hallmarks, again, of this uh, center specifically is the mentorship opportunities that we provide. So part of that mentorship is creating opportunities for Syrian uh, refugees to volunteer as, as trainers and as facilitators and to have the opportunity to work closely with HP. Um, but we've also partnered with um, uh, and, and brought on board um, mentors from a variety of, of places, including Starters Hub and Impact Hub. Um, so I don't know, um, you may be familiar with some of these, they are both global companies. Um, Starters Hub is an entrepreneurship platform um, and it offers startups of, you know, access to funding, mentorship, networking, and, and other kinds of strategic partnership support. Um, so one of our mentors is actually the CEO of Starters Hub in Turkey, um, and he's a, an accredited, he's an entrepreneur himself, he's an angel investor, he's accredited in providing mentorship to entrepreneurs, um, and he's a former senior executive uh, for Groupon, Vodafone, Pricewaterhouse. Um, so very well accomplished in his own right, and, and has come in and, and helped provide mentorship and entrepreneurship um, to, to the students. And then we've also had mentors come in from Impact Hub. Um, and again, maybe familiar with it, Impact Hub is a, a member-based co-working space. Um, and so they've come in and, and provided some entrepreneurship advice and counseling and, and mentorship as well. And, um, you know, before I kind of go on to the next page, this is probably um, kind of a good opportunity to talk about some of the challenges that, that we've had and continue to have in, in working in, in this context, in this environment. Um, so, you know, probably the, the biggest challenge has been the changing operating environment inside Turkey. Um, and um, while we've had great success to date with the Livelihood Center, um, because of the, the Turkish government's um, examination um, of, of international NGOs working inside um, Turkey and specifically work, those working with Syrian refugees, we've had to currently suspend our activities in the Livelihood Center. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's been a tough decision for us to make, but, but one that we made in order to best protect the staff and those we serve as we continue to, to work with the Turkish government to see how we can move forward. Um, and where possible, we've um, shifted courses to local service providers. So we've had um, language classes, some other kinds of vocational skills training classes um, that we've been able to um, relocate to local, um, to those local providers' offices, which has been great. Um, you know, we're um, continuing to work with the government to see when we might be able to resume services. Um, and, you know, one of the things that's been really interesting for us is that we're continuing to see users access HP Life, um, even though they're not um, coming to the center, which is a great part of the program and I think really speaks to how thinking about how to use technology and how to expose um, refugees in these kind of contexts to technology can help continue the education even when um, we can't be there um, on the ground. So uh, that's certainly been a, a learning for us. And, and in thinking about really um, how, you know, our partnership with HP, um, again, as I was referencing earlier, um, the fact that HP has been there with us and has continued to, you know, having conversations about, you know, what happens next and um, how we handle um, the suspension of activities and how we continue to make those services available has been um, great. And that's exactly the kind of, of partner we really appreciate having. 
Um, so that's um, a continuing and ongoing conversation, but certainly one of the realities of, of working in this kind of context. Um, and then just, you know, sort of at the, at the end here, before we really kind of open it up for questions, just highlighting two of our um, refugees who have, um, you know, participated in, in the HP Life program. And um, won't read the stories, you can, you can certainly do that yourselves. But, um, you know, for uh, Fatima, she was someone who, um, whose parents had left Syria and she had to um, pay smugglers to get out herself. She was over 18 when her parents left and so she wasn't able to go with them. Um, and she hasn't had access to higher education, she's really hoping to be a teacher. So um, she taught students in Aleppo. Um, after she left, she's um, come to the center to, you know, access courses and, and to find a sense of community there. And then also Nizar, who um, arrived um, fairly recently um, to Turkey from Aleppo. Um, but he's someone who, you know, is a trained electrical engineer, so certainly very skilled already. Um, but came to the center really trying to, to find opportunities to rebuild his life for, for him and his family. And, you know, one of the things that I think he highlights is just how much of a role the center can play in helping Syrians be a part of a community and um, sort of finding a purpose. And I think that's really where some of our mental health um, impact comes in, that, that by engaging um, older youth um, or young men and women were really able to help Syrians kind of regain that sense of community, which is also, um, of course, so important um, in rebuilding and recovering from the impact of, of conflict. So that's um, certainly something that, while it's not the specific initial objective of the center, is very important and sort of speaks to why we have some of our mental health staff on site um, and in the center when it is open and running. Um, so finally, just, you know, kind of um, highlighting ways to, to partner. Uh, this is, um, you know, this model is something that we are looking to replicate in other uh, refugee centers, and that's certainly always been the intent. We had hoped to replicate it inside uh, Turkey and some other um, urban areas with high numbers of refugees. We're also looking at where we may be able to, you know, to implement a variety of this training um, in Jordan either in some of our Makani centers or safe spaces, which is um, really geared towards a younger audience, but, but still with some of the same kinds of, of training and vocational opportunities. So there's certainly always the opportunity to donate cash or in kind, um, provide some skills-based training um, in software app development, and this can be from the private sector side or to you know, integrate programs that are also working that, that are in this space. Um, and then volunteers, um, you know, we're always looking for volunteer mentors, we're always looking for volunteer entrepreneurs, people with technology expertise, um, people who have employment opportunities, um, and, and or people who might be interested in, in, again, implementing a program that's already worked in another context. So those are, are some of the things that, that we're looking for moving forward. Um, so, at this point, that's sort of the, the end of the overview information, but I know that there's a, a lot of questions, so I'm not sure, um, Frederick or Leila, how best to kind of handle that. Sure, we'll be happy to uh, cover the questions, and uh, we've got quite a few questions coming in, and would uh, encourage people to line up additional ones uh, in the chat window as we go along. Uh, but we'll just take them one at a time. I'll, I'll try to group them in uh, uh, somewhat uh, uh, rational groups, but uh, I think we'll just start from the top. Uh, the first question that came in was, uh, where do you source teaching and support resources? I think you addressed this a little bit, but uh, are they both Turkish uh, teachers or, or, or uh, resources uh, or Syrian refugees themselves, or where, where, do, where do you source them? Sure. Um, so they come from, so for the center itself, it comes from a number of, of areas. So um, we do have some staff that are trainers or master trainers. Um, that, that provides some of our educational opportunities. Um, we um, also have volunteers, and that includes volunteers, um, refugees who've, who've come in and, and are really eager to give back and to help themselves, as, as we discussed. It also includes volunteers who are Turkish nationals um, and may come from companies like Hilton Worldwide, um, who's provided us with some volunteers, especially around um, some of our hospitality training. Um, and then, you know, partnering with groups like Starter Hub or Impact Hub, so to find, again, both Turkish nationals or um, Syrians who are able to, to come in and provide some of the, the skills uh, training opportunities. So it's really a, a mix, and we've, you know, the team on the ground has been really open to, to looking at 
um, you know, trying to meet demand for services. So if there's a particular interest in a type of, of course or education, really trying to find, um, you know, the, the most effective and efficient way possible teachers and trainers who are able to provide those, those training opportunities. Fantastic. And, and just from a technical support perspective and installation of the computers and everything, was uh, HP involved directly or the uh, HP resellers, uh, maybe uh, their channel organizations? I don't believe so, Debbie. You can correct me if I'm wrong. I believe we we provided, you know, our IT team provided most of that, that support. But, Debbie, if you have different information, please jump in. I, I do know that HP Turkey was involved um, in trying to get everything set up, get the computers there and get everything set up. So that was the nice thing is that um, our team on the ground in Turkey was um, very supportive of this program. So um, we got a lot of local support. And terrific. Yeah, that's, uh, that's super important. And it sounds like this partnership is uh, working extremely well. Um, the, uh, uh, I think you also uh, covered mostly, but I, I wanted to, there's no uh, uh, reason we shouldn't repeat some of these things. Uh, it's uh, HP Life focused on specific age groups or target populations. So anybody can use HP Life, but in general we are more focused toward youth, so kind of ages 16 to 35. And again, anybody uh, can use HP Life around the world as long as they have access to the internet. So this is something that I think you mentioned this could be replicated in other um, settings and other locations, uh, just given access either to a PC or, or a smartphone or a tablet. Is that correct? Um, PC, but yes, that is correct. So it is anybody that has access to the internet. And you know, if the language, we're in seven languages, so if there's a good fit from a language perspective, then you know, this is a great resource for people to be able to use. And again, it's self-paced, so people can use it whenever they need it. And it is something that we're specifically looking at and, and starting to engage in conversations around about how we can bring pieces of or some of this model um, with this blended learning and access to the courses to some of the centers that we work out of in Jordan. Fantastic. Great. Um, are there any of these courses uh, that are more popular than the others? Which, which, which are the most um, uh, popular ones for the refugees in Turkey? I um, don't know which is the most popular, but um, the, so I um, don't know that I could answer that. But um, on this page here, um, these are the courses that um, were sort of the um, the grouping of them that were, were most popular and had the, the most um, participants online. Um, and this does, though, um, you know, these were kind of the courses that we offered. So, you know, because we did this blended learning style where we really sort of provided a, a time and a place for people to come and take this specific course in this blended learning fashion, it was then sort of by its very nature kind of the, some of the most um, well attended um, and most popular when we look across um, the variety of courses that are offered. So we, we did have a schedule that was set up where we would, you know, put a post on Facebook, let people know through our networks that, you know, at this day and time we were going to run the digital tools and social media training course or selling online. Um, you know, we would have refugees um, come to the center, take that in the blended learning style, and so then you would see an uptick um, accordingly. Um, anecdotally, um, you know, we received a lot of um, great feedback about some of the courses that were really geared towards some of the entrepreneurship. So, for example, finding funding or selling online or social media marketing seemed to, to get, um, when we look at, at, at Participants who we interviewed; those were the course that names that kept coming up again and again. Great. Yeah, there was a question that came in uh, about uh, alternate or complementary types of education. So, in addition to the business and entrepreneurial courses offered by HP Life, does uh, International Medical Corps offer other education uh, topics for younger audiences, uh, for example, primary mm -hmm. or secondary school students? Mm -hmm. So not so so two separate questions I think so as far as the age bracket this center and and the work in this center really is focused on 
um, 18 to 25 and a little bit older, um, and really around sort of um, older youth and young adults um, on skills-based training that they might be able to use to, to find and access employment services. Um, there are sort of non-IT-led courses that, that people did take, for example, the hospitality course. Um, we also offer quite a bit of, of language courses. You know, one of the primary um, barriers to finding employment and being able to access services in Turkey for refugees has been um, language and you know, not speaking Turkish. Um, so that is something that um, we do quite a bit of. Um, you know, beyond you know, looking at sort of different age brackets, Again, while it's not offered through this center, we do offer other kinds of, of training and engagement opportunities um, through a lot of our programs in Turkey, through some of the multi-service centers. Um, we've had a great program in our Makani centers in Jordan where we do um, you know, an arts engagement program, and that's something that we do replicate at a lot of the centers across the region where we give um, youth, you know, and it's, it's, it's a younger audience, um, you know, primary, early sort of high school audience where we work with them on art, um, video production, the, there will be a link to a video that will be um, presented at the end of, of the talk that was actually um, the footage of the refugees that you'll see in there was actually filmed, that, that concept was designed and filmed by refugee students themselves. Um, it's called I Have a Dream. And it, it's a way to, inter, you know, they interviewed each other about what their dreams are and what they wanted to do and be in the future. and then they they produce the video together. So that, that's certainly one way that we do look to provide these kind of in, engagement opportunities um, to primary and secondary students. Um, we also have, um, again, not through this center, but across some of our other programs, we have a um, junior community health worker program, um, which I'm also happy to share a video for. This is something that we've done um, most often in Iraq, but we, but we are looking at expanding it into other places as well, where we um, train primary and secondary students um, had on some basics, um, usually of, of water sanitation and hygiene um, and hygiene promotion, and they go out with our um, older community health workers and you know help provide training opportunities and, and talk to their friends and their friends' families about how to stay safe and healthy in a refugee context. Excellent. That sounds like a pretty broad set of offerings yeah. here. Uh, I have a couple of questions to come in, uh, particularly for Debbie. Uh, does, does HP have a broader hardware donation program for uh, uh, NGOs, other organizations to apply for? It's not a formal program. Um, what we do try to do is look at countries that we want to work in and um, you know, approach NGOs directly uh, to do that. Um, so that's what happened in this particular situation. Uh, HP did a uh, answered a call for action from President Obama about helping refugees, and so we made a commitment to help refugees. Our commitment was to help in uh, Turkey, Jordan, and Lebanon. So this is one of our programs that we uh, committed to with uh, International Medical Corp in Turkey. So it's more that we uh, um, go out and approach different NGOs uh, in different areas. Yes, yeah, so there were two related questions to that one was how would other NGOs go about partnering with HP, and then Kamal asked you directly a question about Save the Children will be opening two community center for children and adolescents in Hatay, targeting youth at ages 10 to 25. Uh, we're interested in also taking advantage of HP Life e-learning tool in our computer labs. Should we approach you on this? And it's uh, Kamal. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. So again, you know, HP Life is available for everybody to use, and that's you know one of the reasons we did HP Life is because it's something we could put our uh, resources into that would help everybody, right? So anybody can go and access it and use it, and that's a better use of our resources in some ways because it, it has a broader reach. So anybody can use HP Life. We really encourage you know any organizations where HP Life fits is to use it. So absolutely. Um, please go out and use the resources. The educator resources are online as well. Um, so you actually don't need me to, to be able to use it, um, but certainly I'm available. And my contact information was on the slide. We'll put that back uh, up in just a second. Uh, but please contact me if you have questions about HP Life um, or need resources um, to help you in any way. Um, and you know, to that, to that specifically, um, you know, we're also happy to make connections um, to our team on the, the ground in Turkey who's been um, involved in the day-to-day -day application of this, if that's something that's of interest. 
Fantastic, great. Um, there's a question for IMC that came in. Uh, do you believe that this center or skills training would be possible without technology? Well, it's certainly possible without technology, but I think, um, you know, there's certainly all kinds of skills training programs around the world that are doing very good work that are, that are not technology-based. But I do think, um, you know, that, that this particular situation, you know, really speaks to the need to integrate technology. And of course, more and more, um, you know, technology skills and access to technology is going to be incredibly important in any kind of context when you're doing vocational skills training. Um, I think part of, you know, technology has always been part of the design of this center. Um, while we do offer non-technology-based skills training, um, you know, because of, of the target population that we're working with who have had access to, um, you know, great access to technology while inside Syria, you know, certainly before the start of the conflict and, and through much of the conflict, um, you know, it was really important to us to make sure that there were technology-based training opportunities. Um, but I think, you know, and across, I think the global response to this crisis, you know, the use of technology in communication and getting messaging out, it's certainly been um, incredibly important to us to have the Facebook page and, and to be able to use technology to, um, you know, advertise classes, have people enroll online. Um, we did see an uptick in, in attendance when we were allowed to, or not when we were allowed to, but when we, when we initiated the online enrollment feature. Um, to have people come in and, and make sure they knew, knew and understand what was available. So I think it's, it's added, um, it, it's definitely added good elements to the vocational skills training and certainly has been important, especially in this context. Yeah, fantastic. And, and uh, your focus on social media training and, and doing business in the digital world uh, clearly uh, is, is highly dependent on technology, but uh, this, this is all wonderful. Uh, there was a, you, you talked a little bit about jobs and uh, job fairs and things like that. Is your jobs marketplace made avail available through through the technology? Not that formally, and um, that was certainly something that we um, had envisioned to be able to do something much more comprehensive. Um, you know, beyond the kind of job fairs and and creating those connections and networking opportunities, it's largely been. Um, a facilitated conversation where we do get a, a, an advertisement and we sort of make that available through, you know, bulletin boards and email and, and those kinds of things um, through the center. So it hasn't been as formal as a jobs, kind of online jobs market. Um, but, you know, we have been engaging with um, certainly HP and also talking with Samasource um, and other partners about how to um, create a broader network for jobs, how to look at, you know, how to to look at creating opportunities for freelance or consulting work or remote work where we could work with the private sector and other partners to find opportunities where refugees can work or provide, you know, provide a skill um, like social media, you know, things that are really online based and do it in a remote fashion so that there are employment opportunities beyond what is available in Istanbul. Um, so that's, that's certainly an ongoing conversation for us um, and, you know, because we've had to suspend the work um, currently in Turkey, you know, some of that work has um, come to a halt, specifically on the ground of providing any kind of marketplace, but certainly was part of part of the vision. Fantastic. Um, yeah, I understand there, there are a few of those uh, uh, marketplace platforms uh, out there. The question is, how do you engage with either a remote or a, uh, or a local uh, employment uh, opportunities and businesses? So it's uh, there. It's not only technology, but also traditional networking, getting people to, to plug into those types of platforms. Exactly. And Frederick, and also for yeah. those of you who are interested, one of the webinars that we hosted uh, just a couple of weeks ago with Udemy and um, IRC and Western Union highlights uh, one of those re remote employment opportunities specifically to become an instructor, for example, on Udemy platform. It's one of the many, but to Erica's point, really looking at both the local jobs market as well as uh, digital jobs market um, in order to expand op employment opportunities for refugees. So for those of you who are interested, uh, do take a look at the, uh, the webinar uh, from earlier this month. Thank you. Yeah, so we, we have uh, maybe one, one or two more questions. And while we're finishing up and preparing for showing the video, um, I'm going to bring up the, um, uh, the webinar satisfaction poll. This is an interactive uh, screen here that you can go in and uh, 
fill in and certainly would appreciate uh, any feedback you may want to uh, provide. So I'll leave this up for uh, a few minutes here while uh, we're addressing the next question. So a uh, question for both of you, what are your learnings from your partnerships, uh, NGO plus private sector? Would you re recommend that as do's and don'ts, uh, don't, don'ts for private sector companies? Debbie, do you want to take that first or want me to go first? Sure, I can take it first. So I, I think the most important thing is really to define, you know, what the needs are, what the goals are, and make sure there's a good fit uh, in the partnership and what you're trying to accomplish in the country or with the program. So I, I think that's um, really an important start of working uh, together. And then in, in general, just my HP Life perspective, I think the one thing that really works for us um, is that we need those on-ground resources because the real value of HP Life is is actually that blended learning. So there's resources on the ground that really help people, you know, find jobs uh, or start companies and, and be able to help do business coaching and business plan consulting and, you know, career fairs and that type of thing um, along with HP Life. And so by working together, we're able to provide a, a much stronger value uh, to the people on, uh, that are attending these programs. Erica? Mm -hmm. Well, I think um, I agree with all of that. And then I think, um, you know, with any corporate partnership, and, and this one has had, you know, um, some, some particular challenges, um, you know, as a result of the operating environment. But I think um, for us, it's really looking at and approaching partnerships with the private sector by taking a, a individualized and broad look at the assets that the, the private sector company is bringing to the table. And so really, tr you know, working with um, the company or the partner to really explore how to best leverage not just um, funding or in-kind support, which is, of course, incredibly important, but also how you can access their expertise. Um, you know, being able to have access to the HP staff in Turkey, being able to talk with HP Life about how we can best or with Debbie and HP about how we can best create employment opportunities and making those connections. I think really developing those kinds of deep partnerships that look across all of the assets of, that a company is bringing to the table that can help in, in all of the areas where you're working is really important. And I think really approaching it like a, you know, a true partnership um, where you're having that ongoing conversation and dialogue. Um, again, in this instance in particular, because of the challenges, we've had to, to talk quite a bit, um, you know, about sort of how we're going to best move forward together. And I think you know, having that kind of regular and ongoing dialogue really helps to develop trust um, between the partners, um, you know, helps to keep everybody updated and informed and, and helps to create, you know, new solutions. So um, that's all very important. And of course, you know, right alongside that is flexibility and in and, and having the opportunity to talk to the partners about whatever kinds of challenges that you're seeing and, and creating, you know, flexible and creative responses to them. Thank you very much. And I think one key, another key do uh, would be to share your learning and share the experience that we've had, uh, just like you've done here today. We would truly appreciate uh, all the great information and, and learning more about this partnership you've had and, and wish you uh, best of luck trying to uh, reinitiate re the center itself, but also spread uh, the use of the HP Live Life, uh, uh, you know, as, as broad as possible for whatever use cases may be useful. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll close out with a video now, so uh, I'll uh, run that, and then we'll, we'll come back towards the very end and, and uh, do a, uh, a roundup. So hopefully you can see the video, and I'll get that started.
Well, thank you very much, uh, both of you. This uh, was a, a great video. And then, a great, so you're saying, uh, Erica, this was a video that was actually produced by the students themselves. Uh, not sorry, not this video. The, the okay. other video um, that'll be shared on YouTube. This okay. is a life video. Yep. Or a tweet video. Okay. Yeah, we'll we'll, we'll definitely do the, send that um, um, link out with the follow up emails as well. So thank you uh, both very very much. Thank you, Layla, for uh, creating this uh, very interesting series of uh, uh, based on the No Last Generation uh, Tech Task Force. And uh, uh, it just remains for me to. Uh, uh, say uh, thank you and uh, goodbye to everyone. Uh, I hope this has been useful. Uh, look for a follow-up email uh, from us uh, either later today or tomorrow. And feel free to share these fantastic resources with colleagues uh, and uh, uh, friends uh, throughout uh, the development world and uh, in your refugee response efforts. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a great rest of your day, afternoon, evening. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.